Hi, I'm Dr. Donald Levy, and I will be taking our a different tack for the next hour or so. We've been through an amazing description of the biochemistry and the neuroscience and some of the cultural science. And I'm going to go into now with a team of people who have treated people with depression or have patients with depression, um, the lived experience of being depressed and why it fits to me very well into an integrative medicine perspective. And I'll say only one thing about myself, about 40 years of practice in medicine, 20 years as a primary care doctor, and about 20 switching into integrative medicine. And what does that actually mean? Integrative medicine is, had, all, it's had all these names. We're now talking about integrative health. Uh, it used to be holistic, et cetera. And what is it? What's, what's special about it, different than when I was a primary care doc? It's a, an attitude of mind that looks certainly preferentially to use therapeutic lifestyle changes or TLC, as the American College of Cardiology calls it. Uh, and also something is always, we're always thinking about, can we enhance a person's innate ability to heal and to recover from, you know, from, bad, from illness and stay in good health? And we have a lot of perspectives. We were very interested in the patient's health beliefs, their habits, nutrition, very interested in the therapeutic relationship that we develop with a patient to help them heal. It's got no single paradigm. We draw from everything we can draw from. So it's interesting to think of what's our philosophy. And this is from a historian of medicine who said, what's special to modern Western medicine, it's one healing system, but it has formally at least broken with the traditional wisdom of the body. And herein lies its strengths as well as its weaknesses traditional wisdom of the body. That's sounding uh, very philosophical, but it leads to strengths and weaknesses in treatment. For example, we sort of are saying that in Western medicine, the body is a fabulous machine. And if we are a machine, machines have broken parts and the doctor then becomes a mechanic. We're really best as mechanics when there's something acute happening, an acute illness, a crisis, you fell off a truck, you go to the ER, get someone to put you back together. But as multi-dimensional beings, the doctor might be better seen as a gardener. This is especially more, more useful for people who have chronic illnesses or emotional illnesses, like everything we're talking about today. We need gardening as well as the mechanics of the neuroscience. Um, so what is a mechanic? I mean, mechanic fixes a broken part. So hard to do that with depression. Is there one broken part? Is it just chemistry, neuroscience? What is it? Is it culture? It's all of them. Um, the gardener is interested in everything, the plant, the soil, the, the rhythms of nature, and somehow becoming more resilient as a being. But I think it's important to say we are going back in our philosophy to this thing called vitalism, which says there's something more than being a, a mechanism or an, or, or an organic thing. Vitalism has lost a lot of its prestige as we've come to be very sophistic sophisticated about the chemical nature of things and the neurosciences, for example, and, and what we're doing and what we're learning about today. And I think it's useful for all of us to just take a moment to say, what's your philosophy of healing? Are we, are we a good machine with brain chemistry that needs fixing? Uh, what, what's behind what we do? Is culture more important? Is language meaning? It's good to just explore that a bit because it says something about how you'll treat people. So in three principles that are big for me in, in talking about integrative medicine, uh, pain is not the same as suffering, disease is not the same as illness, and curing is not the same as healing. You might have heard about these three concepts from other people. I didn't invent any of them. What does it mean pain is not the same as suffering? Cassell is a book that everyone going to med school should read, The Nature of Suffering and the Goals of Medicine. He said pain is not the same as suffering. When does pain become suffering? Well, when it gets completely out of control. If you're in pain and you don't know, you just can't stop it, it's overwhelming. You don't know what it is, that swelling in your stomach. Is it cancer? That totally changes your experience of the pain and becomes suffering very quickly. Or what if it means, oh my God, whatever it is I have is getting worse. The, the meaning of it is dire, it's horrible. Um, and what if it looks like it's never gonna end? No one seems to have any way to help me. You are now defining suffering. And I think suffering pain units often 
fail because they forget to treat the suffering. Um, disease is not the same as illness. Disease happens to a tissue, an organism. It's the, it's the pathological diagnosis we see under labs. Illness happens to a person. It has a meaning and it has an impact on their on life. And that's especially what we heard in the previous talks about culture and uh, background and so many of the things that were spoken about earlier this morning. Uh, a wonderful article by Arthur Kleinman and, uh, and others, Culture, Illness, and Care from 1978, 50 years ago. Again, probably the, it's, it's, it's as true as it ever was. Curing is not the same as healing. Curing is a process of eliminating the disease part, being a, being a mechanic and getting the part fixed. Healing is something more. And I think it only applies to, to living beings and humans like ourselves. It's a process of repairing, renewing, becoming whole again. And healing may or may not include curing. Some people, their life is at the end and they feel whole again. They feel, they feel alive and they're ready, uh, but they've never been cured. And some people get cured, but they never get over it, what happened to them and never feel whole again. Hemingway said, the world breaks everyone and afterward many are strong at the broken places. And farewell to arms. That's a big one. It's a big, interesting thing to talk about. And we may talk about it among ourselves today as therapists. Healing, wholeness, being broken. It seems to me we're all a little broken. We're not the, not the first to notice that. And when we acknowledge that we are have our own brokenness within us, do we become better healers? We are taught in med school, maybe no. You should keep your tears to yourself. Stay, put that white coat on and be some kind of being. But we're all broken. And I like what Rachel Remen, uh, Rachel Naomi Remen says, it is the wisdom gained from our wounds and from our experiences of suffering that makes us able to heal. And I love this, expertise cures, but wounded people can best be healed by other wounded people. So now we're going into concepts way beyond chemistry. Um, uh, this, is, this is the recommended book, Kitchen Table Wisdom by Rachel Remen, the gift, the greatest gift we bring to anyone who is suffering is our wholeness and listening. Um, listening is magic. And I don't know if it's, we have had enough science, enough science attending to it. Um, our listening creates sanctuary for the homeless parts within the other person, that, that which has been denied, unloved, devalued by themselves and by others. And I love this, this last one, listening creates a holy silence. When you listen generously to people, they can hear, truth in themselves. And often for the first time and in the silence of listening, you can know yourself and everyone. We're now getting obviously into something very deep and very special to human beings who live and experience. And so I'll end the last slide here is when we're trying to get to suffering and illness and healing rather than pain and disease and curing. Some of the questions that Arthur Kleinman and Cassell have suggested that might come up, which I think apply to depression. This is for all doctors. I use these in primary care for, for anything, that stomach ache. What do you think caused it? Why did it start when it did? Why do you think it start when it did, by the way? Why do you think, what do you think caused it? What has it done to your life? What's been the impact? Whatever it is, fill in the blank, in this case, depression. What kind of treatment do you think you need? If you're a strong bio biological type, you want to chemical treatment, I need an antidepressant. If you're not, you may need something else culturally or otherwise. You need to be listened to and talked to. If you miss that one, I have in my career missed what I thought, I didn't ask a person what they thought they needed. And when I didn't give them the antibiotic for a sore throat, they said, I was a terrible doctor. I learned from that. I didn't ask them what they thought they needed. And in, in depression, that's a more subtle question. And really, what are you most worried about? What's happened to you that really worries you the most? So we're about to talk now to a few other, or hear from a few other people around, around the lived experience of depression and what these four clinicians have learned about themselves and about patients who are depressed and how we can help them. So I'm hoping this is a rich experience. Each of the people to follow will introduce themselves and we're gonna see some videos and we're gonna talk uh, about what we've just seen. So I will pass it on now. My, the next person to speak is, is Dr. Shannon Scott-Bernaglia, who's going to share her own experience in a video 
We're going to have a patient and the doctor in the same share her own experience, and then we'll, she will comment and, and we will comment on it. So Shannon, I, wait, I look forward to it, your talk. Wonderful. Um, thank you, um, Don, and thank you um, to the organizers for inviting me to be here today. I'm Dr. Shannon Scott Fernalia. I'm a primary care uh, pediatrician at the Mass General, where I've been practicing for going on 20 years. And so in that time, my patients have grown up and I've accumulated more teenagers. And so the slides earlier in the day about the second and third decade um, being really prime times for the um, presentation of depression is certainly my experience as a clinician um, and a big part of what I do every day in my practice. Today, I come with both hats, as Don uh, uh, mentioned, and I come today also um, to share my lived experience as a patient. For while I have cared for patients with depression um, for my whole career, um, kind of partway through it, uh, my life was turned pretty upside down by my own experience with a episode of major depression. I'm gonna share a video um, that I put together for the MGH with you today to um, kind of open that um, and then can be um, part of the panel in, in both roles as people, uh, as questions uh, match. So here we go. Good morning. I've been here at the MGH for the last 20 years, and being part of TEDx MGH is just such an honor. It's also the first time my kids have been excited about something I'm doing at work, so thanks for that. Here at MGH, I'm a general pediatrician, and I run the pediatric residency program. At home, I'm a daughter, a mom, a sister, and I have two amazing kids and a wonderful husband. You could look at my Facebook profile or my Doximity profile and see a picture-perfect version of my life and my career. But what we don't put in our speaker bios, what people don't put on their social media profiles, is another part of me. And that's the part that suffers from anxiety and depression. And that's the part I want to talk to you about today. Depression. Depression. Sometimes I like to say it twice because for years it held a power over me to not be able to name an illness for myself that I found easy to name, treat, and diagnose for my patients. Depression. A disease that will impact nearly a third of people over the course of their lifetime. Depression. A little like Voldemort, once you say its name, it loses a little bit of its power. So let me tell you a little bit about my story of depression. I was almost 40, and yes, I hear the midlife crisis joke too, but the truth is I was almost 40 when I suffered from major depression. I had two small kids at home, a busy academic career, and I was new to my job as a residency director. A beautiful summer had bled into fall and suddenly it was darkness of winter. Insidiously inside me, my days had become darker too. I would see patients in the morning and then as I tried to finish notes and get out, transitioning home was really hard. I'd miss dinner, then bedtime, and my inner voice knew that only a terrible mother would miss dinner time and then bedtime. I'd get almost weekly emails from people saying, gee, so-and-so knows you as a pediatrician and says you're great, could I bring my baby to see you? And I couldn't understand why, because I knew I was a terrible doctor. I knew I had buffaloed the world into thinking somehow I knew what I was doing, when all I really did was listen, maybe with kindness. <laughs> Mind you, the core of general pediatric care is attentive and kind listening, but my inner voice didn't care, because she knew I was failing. I was failing as a doctor. I was failing as a residency director. I was failing as a mother. I was failing. There were days where I would be crying in one exam room with a patient on the other wall next to me, and I didn't see any option other than to open the door and flee, leaving medicine forever, or to somehow dry my eyes and go in and see that next patient. I like to think lucky for me and hopefully lucky for my patients. I didn't even have the energy to open the door and run away. Instead, with the help of a good friend and colleague, I made my way to the office of a wonderful MGH psychiatrist. I asked for help. I didn't like asking for help. I didn't want to need help. In medicine, we're often praised for not needing help. Good job, strong work, they say. But I needed help. I asked for help and I received help. 
Some of that help was in the form of medications, medications I will admit I hated taking. Some of them didn't even work, some caused side effects, and I really was a terrible patient and hated taking them. And the irony of prescribing the very same medications for my patients that I felt really angry about taking for myself wasn't lost on me. And that inner voice, that inner voice was happy to mock me for my hypocrisy. But over time, with a lot of therapy, with that same wonderful doctor, and with the steadfast love of my family around me, I started to hear another little voice in my head. And this inner voice was capable of showing me compassion and grace. And that little voice is the voice I want to share with you today. Because she knows kindness, self-compassion, and grace. And she knows a thing or two about stigma and isn't afraid to talk about it. Stigma is what causes 40 to 50% of physicians to say they wouldn't seek care for mental illness. Stigma is the unconscious bias we carry that says that mental illness is weakness, not illness. Stigma creates the divide, making it even harder to get access to mental health care than it is to get access to regular health care. And stigma is killing people. 400 physicians a year die of suicide in this country more than one every day. As a female physician, I'm more than two times as likely to die of suicide, nearly two and a half times as likely as my age-matched peers. And in all walks of life, in all careers, untreated mental illness is killing people. And that is just not acceptable. People like me who suffer from mental illness deserve to be treated, deserve to not be afraid to ask for help. It's okay to not be okay. I said at the beginning that I wear a lot of hats and I do a lot of different things. And I like to think of my life as a rich and beautiful tapestry. One thread of that tapestry is mental illness. It's not a thread I chose or would choose again, but it's an important part of who I am today. And I do choose to talk about it. I choose to shine light on that thread to make it easier for others to talk about their struggles. I choose to shine light on that thread because it amplifies the inner voice of kindness and compassion. I ask you to think about those in your life, your friends, your colleagues, your patients who might be suffering. Think about ways to honor their suffering. Think about ways of noticing they're courageous. People often say that when I talk about my depression, I'm being courageous. Let me tell you, I'm a little nervous being here today for sure. But this doesn't take courage. What took courage, what was really hard, was getting up each morning when I didn't think there was a reason to. Because courage, courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes courage is the little voice that tells you, I'll try again tomorrow. And there are those out there trying again tomorrow, and we need to create space to help them understand it's okay to not be okay. I beg you to sit with others suffering. Depression is a very lonely disease. Allow people to share their stories with you. That little voice in my head that I like to amplify, she knows that vulnerability isn't a vulnerability at all. That vulnerability is our superpower. It allows us to share our humanity. It's the superpower that's capable of changing the future of this world. And that is a future I want to be a part of. A future where people aren't afraid to talk about their struggles. A future where it's not hard to access mental health care. A future where we allow ourselves to be vulnerable with one another and to share our humanity. A future where we embrace the lines, I am brave, I am bruised, I am who I'm meant to be, this is me. This is me, and the future is now. Thank you. Thank you for letting me share a little bit of my story. And I look forward to uh, talking further, both um, as a patient and a doctor. You're up, Albert. Back to you. OK. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's program. My name is Albert Young. I'm a psychiatrist at the Massachusetts General Hospital and also a psychiatrist in 
South Cove Community Health Center in Boston's Chinatown focusing on um, services to Chinese immigrants. I'm going to show you a videotaped interview with a Chinese patient who suffers from depression. We want to demonstrate what depression is like from a Chinese patient's point of view. The symptoms he experienced. Notice that he did not mention much about his depressed mood. And this is very common among non-Western patients and how he sought help, the treatment he received and how and why his depression relapsed and the importance of family support. So we'll put on the video now. Dying 當時就是頭醫醫頭先所講的就不適應環境就來到這裡一段時間就不適應而走不到工作當時就產生焦慮的情緒心情就不是很好當時自己什麼都很清醒什麼都想不到但當時是要很輕微的有些焦慮就不是很開心的情形今次就是 Sailing 有些事情自己覺得做得不夠理想所以出現了一種自責的心理 持續半年太一次,最後到2006年,2007年的時候,一年的見一次,已經延遲我這段時間是正常的工作 反應就是,有一段就反應很遲鈍 
一開始咧就喺喺你哋華人醫護中心心理科呢度，原來咧就喺前一個外籍醫生去睇過啦，睇過之後咧，因為佢講英語又翻譯嘅咁，咁咧當時我咧就都唔想講話唔溝通得到，所以我個太太咧同我個女咧都一直陪住我去咧，只要講嘅。誒、呃、介紹我嘅情況都係由佢哋講，我都唔冇喺交往啲時候已經已經係比較嚴重啦。即係應該按照而家講咧，就係抑鬱症嘅嘅嘅明顯症狀應該係啦。用咩方法治療咧？誒、呃，所以咧就食藥界有時啊又唔係幾好，我所以咧就係主要係呢種情況啦。食藥嘅效果好唔好啊？食藥一開始咧就係、是。誒一九年初咧，就喺你哋華人院誒醫務中心心理科去睇，開始咧就係、是、誒、呃、醫生咧就一開始一個星期見一次咧，咁開到都一不不斷咁調整誒藥、呃、量啊，同埋啲藥嘅咧咁一直一直咧就後嚟都一個月見一次，但係咧效果都唔係好好。唔係好好咧，就一直都都係誒、呃、我太太同我女陪住我去去去睇嘅啫。當時咧，如果啊太太個同埋個女唔陪你嘅話咧，你會唔會嚟睇醫生咧？即係我我咧就對睇醫生呢度，我都唔拒絕佢，因為我我已經一直都係係由零二年咧就開始都一直都都係睇，都係呢個時候。都係我自己一個人去嘅，都係都係一八年之前咧，呢啲去見醫生，全部我自己去去睇，唔使人陪嘅。啲、okay. 情況好，啲呢次出現印咗反覆咧，咁咧就都一開始都唔係咁噶，後嚟咧慢慢慢慢發展到嚴重咧，就自己唔想出聲咁，所以咧佢就好好擔心咧，就一直都會陪住我去睇。即係當時係你自己主動去。揾醫生睇嘅就唔係屋企人帶你去睇嘅，唔係我我係好我一開始都係好主動去要求去睇醫生嘅。O K， 誒即係即係而從現嚟嘅零二年呢個時候都係咁嘅，即係我都係好主動，唔係話要要家人去去乜嘢咁咁嘅，因為我你覺得精神科對你嘅幫助係相當相當有幫助嘅。經濟科對我係完全有好大嘅幫助。如果唔係係話睇呢啲心理科啊咁嘅嘅話咧，我就係冇話正常嘅生活。所以咁多年嚟咧，一直咧我都係都食藥，食藥食到我誒、呃、一八年嘅六二呢個時候咧，都係食。當時咧，因為我我當時咧就係、是、要嘅想法咧就係、是。誒、呃、一直已經係誒、呃、上十幾年啦，十幾年咧都係食食藥咧咁啊，想到咧可唔可以減啲藥量咧？咁喺度慢慢慢慢減少咗，可以唔使食啲咁樣嘅諗法。Mm-hmm. 但係咧，我都係一直都食藥，冇我冇停過。Okay. 不過咧就係、是、我個想法又要講個醫生知道咧佢。但係佢開藥咧都係誒開兩頭嚟都兩種藥，每每一種咧都係食一粒嘅。嗯嗯。咁咧就係而係係早都係晚上瞓覺前食嘅。O K。咁咁後嚟咧，我因為咁嘅情況下咧，因為我因為減到二二分一粒，後嚟咧就就都一直都冇事，最後都。到呢個時候嚟咧，誒、呃，最後一六年一七年嘅時候咧，我就就食四分一粒，但係都一直都冇試到。到一八年，醫生同唔同意嘅咧？醫生同唔同意你減藥減到咁低咧？我呢個咧就係而家我翻轉頭睇到咧，呢、這個就係唔啱噶啦，即係證實咗，因為咧，因為我減出嚟藥量咧。就就係、是、呢、这個後嚟咧，我我我十
四四分一粒嘅時候咧，就係係冇講醫生知嘅。所以咧，翻轉頭講咧，就係呢個就係唔啱。通過呢次咧，我意識到咧，一定如果係好咗之後咧，一定要遵照醫生嘅意見，要定期去檢查。按照醫生配嘅嘢講，如果你話俾醫生知你減藥嘅話咧，你想醫生會唔會同意咧？咁我我曾經講過咧，減一四零二分一粒嘅時候咧，就講過後嚟咧，就一直都係咁開咧，就到到四分一粒嘅時候咧，都食咗要成兩年都冇事，但係咧呢啲時候我又繼續食，但係咧呢時候係唔係唔冇話俾醫生知。所以翻轉頭而家發病咧，我我又有呢個感覺咧，可能咧就係而減到日價上咧，就係、是、有啲心煩嘅事啊，咁咯，再復發嘅嚴重。即係一方面係減藥，啊醫生唔知道；一方面可能有心煩嘅事咧，所以依一次咧就再發病啦，係咪咁？係啦，係啦。咁而家咧就經過藥物治療同埋電療咧，依一次咧就已經好咗好多啦，係嘛？而家咧就係電療之後咧就誒，因為係應該係二一年三月咧，係你阿楊醫生咧就見到我食藥嘅效果唔係好理想咧，就係推薦我咧就去做電竅核治療，應該係電療啦。咁所以咧，我你經得我同意，我哋我哋都同意啦。因為我因為都睇得咁耐咧，我又都一直都好接受誒呢、呃這個心理健康呢個去治療噶。咁你既然推進我咧，有現在要科學嘅治療方法咧，咁所以我啲都亦都同意，同意咧就會進行啲。恢复咗会唔会恢复翻十足啊？喺电疗咧就开始就系一二一年嘅四月份开始去做电疗啦。电疗之后咧就一直咁开始就系一个星期做三次，咁随后咧就减到一个星期做两次。再減到咧，就一個星期做一次。O K。咁做咗一個星期做一次之後咧，因為個個嘅療效咧都比較好，所以我感感覺到嘅身體咧都越嚟越舒服。好、嗯、多謝你嘅參加，俾我哋咁嘅機會咧去訪問你，同埋瞭解你治療嘅過程。好多謝你，黃生。啊，多謝你。O K， 拜拜。好，拜拜，拜拜。拜拜。So should we go next to Randy before we even talk about all we've seen, or would you want to say a few things, Dr. Jung, before Randy Paulson speaks? Um. So is it Randy's? Time or should I comment on this? Well, what it would be good. Let's let Randy speak. Randy, you've listened now to two, two different presentations, sure. yeah. patients, two very different ones. Yeah, and yeah. you have never seen them or heard of them before. So this is putting you right on the spot. Yeah. What did, your first thoughts? You as a psychiatrist, like, tell us one word about yourself. What you um, I'm a, a semi-retired psychoanalyst and mind-body consultant. I worked with Don in the Osher Clinical Center at the Brigham for um, 13, 14 years since um, I retired a couple of years ago. Um, I learned to teach meditation. I uh, trained in psychoanalysis. And um, this has been a very, very rich morning and I'm very admiring of of uh, Shannon and uh, Dr. Young's patient, I thought in both cases it was sort of the evolution toward a we instead of an I. That there was a kind of isolation of Shannon's description of being in the room crying with the patient in the next room and finally uh, asking for help. 
um, was where the courage really was. And uh, it's also very courageous of her to, to tell us her story of um, being part of it. Um, Dr. Young's patient in its Chinese culture is, uh, you know, evidencing the same thing that uh, depression can isolate us. He's a man who's kind of uh, not telling his psychiatrist that he's adjusting his meds. And uh, it seems to have gradually gotten to the point where he both trusts and talks to Dr. Young about uh, about his suffering. So this, it's been a primary theme of the morning, I think, the move from uh, I, uh, the isolation of the whether it's a voice telling you you're a failure or I've often heard in cultural traditions, uh, in Chinese cultural tradition, there's a sense of uh, uh, mental illness or depression being a kind of a curse or a, a, a shame on your ancestors. And uh, lots of all, all, all kinds of cultures have uh, ways of both stigmatizing and uh, trying to deal with depression. I thought that this morning's session that, that uh, showed as long as mammals have been on earth that there's been depression and suffering i think in some ways making a place for suffering as something that's accepted is a really important cultural advance that still we're still struggling with in, in western society um we're uh, uh shannon mentioned the notion of stigma and how much it uh, causes people to not uh I don't know, not share their depression, not seek help. Um, I think in a, in a yes, ironic way that the uh, if we get too ambitious about um, preventing depression, the, the implication is that we're going to eliminate it uh, like we would eliminate um, diabetes or these, these conditions are lifelong. Uh, I think depression, suffering is present in life and it's really more that we need a non-shame based uh, way of creating relationships that are tailored to the person um, and uh, help them um, you know I mean there's a biological element to depression uh, Dr. Young's patient needed ECT Shannon talked about needing medication I myself am a wounded healer uh, in the sense that uh, one goes through a long or a pretty involved psychoanalysis to become a psychoanalyst. And, um, you know, I think that the notion of healing is best done by other wounded healers is it's important because there uh, is a sort of a shared connection. And um, I feel like I just you know, in my own journey with uh, depression and training, um, one of the things I remember my analyst saying uh, about depression was, uh, he said, depression can give you a sense of direction. And I think once um, a person can talk and relate, and maybe they're out of a state of biological catatonia or um, shortened telomeres in old age or whatever the biological problems have been addressed enough so that a person can begin to enter a relationship that's important and uh, honoring depression or suffering is something that helps us uh, guide our lives it's um i think the two major affects this is some um, another old mgh uh, wizard davery weissman uh, you know um, Depression and anxiety are the two main rudders that we sail a ship of our sail our ship on the seas of life. Um, so, um, no, giving depression the recognition that uh, if we uh, share it, deal with it, talk, maybe maybe reveal that inner voice that's calling us a failure, maybe. Uh, talk about the fact that in some ways early on our developmental uh, trajectories had a sense of never being seen. These are all really uh, valuable developmental moments and uh, they are lifelong. And uh, I think honoring the fact that they made them back, we may go back and see our, our therapists, our analysts, or uh, some trusted uh, friend uh, the other uh, thing that uh, my analyst said that I think is important for this morning, um, uh, he said, try not to get depressed about being depressed. And 
I, I think of uh, Dr. Silberschweig and the amygdala, the sort of angry, reactive, um, kind of self-punishing um, sense of, uh, you know, getting angry at the self, being down. You know. these, these moments, they're valuable, actually. We learn a lot in our depressions. They deepen our sense of what it means to be human. Um, and I, I think this, uh, from every talk we heard this morning, the importance of a therapeutic alliance or a relationship was stressed and emphasized. And, um, you know, the, uh, the quote from Steinbeck, a sad soul can kill you quicker. It's that sad, isolated soul that kills people, not, not, not sadness itself. And I think mourning and uh, sadness uh, actually, when we're dealing with the separation anxiety that Dr. Fischel talked about as, uh, as a primary um, kind of toxic uh, neuropsychological uh, force in our lives, um, separation is, is often best dealt with by allowing there to be mourning and allowing there to be appropriate and meaningful uh, sadness because uh, that emotion um, is a connection to what we've lost or what we're going through. So I think honoring, honoring suffering, um, being honest about our own wounded healer lives. Uh, I like to just finish up with the uh, really light uh, Shannon's comment that uh, she's here wearing two hats uh, as a patient and a doctor. Uh, and I am too, I think we all are. Um, so, there's more to say, but that's enough for now. I'll let, uh, let us get back to the panel. I just want to say one thing that I hope we all comment for a moment on something very radical that we're bringing up here, that this is not a condition to be you know, eliminated like polio. This is mm -hmm. not, we don't need a vaccine against depression. You're saying something radical that wait a minute, this is part of our human experience. How do we incorporate it into our lives, mm -hmm. live with it, honor it, actually? You're, mm -hmm. Both of you sort of hinted at Shannon's description too. Mm -hmm. um, this is not a condition to be eliminated. Yeah, this I think is it, it adds to our sense of stigma if we feel like it should be eliminated and we shouldn't have it. It's, uh, it's an ironic outcome of, of this kind of... Uh, uh, sort of winner take all or combative uh, prevention approach. It's not. It's not all that humanistic. It, well, it also is reminding me of you know Buddhist that life is suffering. Mm -hmm. Or ask any Jewish grandmother; they'll tell you the same thing. Like like yeah good. yeah. <laughs> or like, any grandmother uh, really. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> so who is? I love having a conversation here. Whoever wants to speak up. Um, Shannon, do you want to say more about what you went through or Dr. Jung, what you, what, what you presented, I mean? I very much appreciated. I think his name was Mr. Wong, a patient of Dr. Jung. And, the, you know, that feeling of like, didn't even feel connection enough to kind of manage the um, manage medications with the clinician at the time, right? I think the fit of clinician is so important and feeling heard. Um, and as a primary care pediatrician, I would just say that I think for a long time, I thought maybe I was, you know, being a fraud, I'm not trained as a therapist, and yet realizing that actually the human connection and important listening is um, healing has been really helpful in my own practice caring for um, children and adolescents and young adults with um, depression because kind of regular contact and the chance to kind of talk through what they're going through, I think is um, quite therapeutic. So I really appreciated thinking about that as he was talking about, you know, I didn't like my medicine either, but I would at least fess up if I was gonna, you know, demand to have it switched. Um, I actually don't think that's what made me better. I think my therapy is what helped me. <laughs> Ultimately, yeah. So I presented this case partly because of my own observation in the past 20 something years treating Chinese immigrants. Um, they would tell you about their uh, decreased interest, they're isolating themselves, they do not talk, they are not functioning. They rarely talk about their depressed mood. And uh, there are many hypotheses, possibly uh, they live with their depressed mood for a long time and then they do not think this is something to report 
or this is a personal issue not to report to a doctor, or they do not have a mind-body dichotomy, and then they think illness is a bodily thing. They do not have to talk about their mood. But having said that, if you ask skillfully in the right language or in an open format, like how's your mood, they will tell you that, no, not good. Mm -hmm. But if you ask them, do you have depressed mood? It, translation is a big issue. Uh, they may not be the best term uh, that uh, non-Western, non-English speaking patients use that term and then sometimes we miss it. So I'm trying to bring, bring the attention of cultural sensitivity to a lot of patients from non-Western cultures and uh, listen carefully and look at their facial expression and ask using the local language, you may get the, the reporting of depressed mood. Yeah. Do you think he would have, did he respond to non-Chinese, someone he, he didn't identify with? He, he said he'd seen people before. I lost track of how, of how many, who he saw when, like going over the years. Was it something you picked up? Because I might not have known what you, what you know and thought, okay, well, he's pretty, uh, maybe depression went to come into my mind unless I just felt that being in his presence, this is somebody depressed, is there, what, what, would he ever, would he respond to someone, not you? Yes, uh, they, they, they do. Most Chinese patients are seeing non-Chinese uh, clinicians because there are not enough Chinese speaking clinicians or Chinese clinicians. Yeah. Uh, I, thought, I thought he was referring to that. Uh, he was seeing a non-Chinese psychiatrist at that time. He was depressed and not willing to talk and then his family was doing the talking. Not that he was not able to relate to a non-Chinese psychiatrist. I see. Yeah, I, I thought there was a key moment when he said, uh, I began just telling, telling uh, him my thoughts, just talking about my thoughts. And that seemed like a, a real life shift for this man, you know, that he, he began to do that. And uh, I'm thinking back to Dr. Patel's wonderful plenary this morning about uh, the global approach to depression and this notion of tailoring the relationships that are provided um, to cultural and personal um, styles. And, you know, I think there is a way in which Dr. Okereke, to go back to the, the, the kind of uh, uh, really amazing uh, scientific research that's going on in terms of um, tailoring treatment. Um, and I, I, I do think that uh, something about uh, there's a there's a uh, a theory in psychoanalysis these days, which I like very much, called field theory, which is that um, the test of whether what you say is useful to the patient has to do with being paying careful attention to what happens in immediately after you say it, so that you can, as the as the healer or treater, you. You need to pay attention to whether something landed or not, and and be willing to really give that reaction in the patient authority to sh shift direction that you're going in. Um, so I think of those people in uh, India or Texas uh, with the digital um, uh, guides on how to address people with depression, and I. I hope I haven't seen the um, device or seen the program yet, but I was excited about the um, effort to really bring uh, culturally non-distant people into the field who understand and speak the language, but who are getting some guidance around, um, you know, how to make a space. I hope that's, you know, make a space for the patients to say what the suffering was, the nature of it is. Um, you know, it's, well, that's enough for now, but that's that's what, some comment I thought about uh, your patient, Dr. Young. And, and also, we talk about depression, like everyone accepts this diagnosis. In fact, um, earlier, like 15 years ago, when I tell patients that you have depression, 50% of the time, patients would tell me that never heard of this. Yeah. And, and also, they have not read DSM. They don't know what depression means. Mm -hmm. And if you say you have depression, that means you have a mental illness, which is very scary for a lot of non-Western patients. Um, only very sick people see psychiatrists in Asian countries. 
So they don't want to have mental illness. All mental illness are scary to people outside of the Western world because psychiatrists in non-Western countries see very sick patients because they're so full of them. Mm -hmm. We have that problem in this country too, but uh, you know, it's only, you have to be very sick. And um, one of the uh, adventures in my life, I spent a year working at the Schweitzer Hospital in West Africa. And um, my assignment for three of the months was taking care of mental patients there. And uh, the, um, I, I made a friendship with a witch doctor who was doing treatment of adolescents. And it was amazing to see the cultural adaptations of what I think of as excellent community psychiatry. The, the first treatment was the family was there, the witch doctor and the adolescent is a classic depressed adolescent who wasn't getting out of bed. And, uh, Basically, he, the whole treatment took place in a one night dance with the witch doctor. And the search was when in this uh, teenager's life did things go off track? And um, they found uh, a time that he remembered is very traumatic and uh, did a kind of exorcism of that in the dance. And then two weeks later, there was a dance of self-expression where the, where the adolescent sort of came out to the community, to the village. And then two weeks after that was a, a dance that included the whole village as sort of welcoming him into the, in the community. And uh, that model of uh, community psychiatry actually sort of guided me a lot in running an inpatient unit in a day hospital and all kinds of other things. It's uh, the, the it, it was very seminal this morning that uh, cultures have been dealing with suffering, depression, you know, 10,000 years. So there's, there's a lot to learn from how many cultures have dealt with it. So anyway. Yeah, it's very different in different cultures. I was thinking about um, before psychiatry came to Asia, what did they do with people who are depressed? And I thought about possibly using meditation, um, maybe listening to music, uh, possibly doing Tai Chi or Qigong, acupuncture, herb, herb medicine. Uh, I personally studied the use of Tai Chi acupuncture uh, for patients with depression and found that it can be fairly effective. Of course, we still need larger randomized clinical trials, but still um, the preliminary data have been very promising. You want to say Shannon? Shannon. I was, yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like there's a, a question in the chat about um, the idea of sharing one's own story and the power of vulnerability as uh, in healing. And so I thought I would take that one. Um, I, I will, I will say that I, um, for me, it was really important to be in remission um, before I felt yeah, comfortable on a broad scale sharing um, parts of my story. I think mm -hmm. um, in re you know early recovery with certain people, I would share pieces of it. But before I wrote a published narrative, before I uh, went and did a TEDx and um, began mm -hmm. to speak um, nationally on this or tweet about it, I needed to feel um, more well. Um, I will say I ha during COVID had a pretty significant um, recurrence of debilitating anxiety and was able to kind of continue to speak. I actually um, taped my TEDx during that period of time. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it, it, it is more about kind of how I could integrate the experience. And that part is the part I want to get to about this healing. I really embraced the um, idea of post-traumatic growth. I didn't call mm -hmm. it that when it was happening, but in now, under yeah. <laughs> now yeah. understanding yeah. that model, that's exactly what happened for me. Yeah. It was being able to put this experience that for me was utterly un not understandable into some context, to learn from that, to grow from that. And the last pieces of um, the model of post-traumatic growth is like, you know, helping others. And while I don't yes. in any way think anyone should or needs to share their story if that's not right for them, that became very right for me and a part of my own healing is to stand up and talk about this because the truth is, is if even one person listening at any given time that I'm speaking goes and seeks care or notices they're depressed, to your point, like 
I didn't notice I was depressed. I just knew I wasn't functional for a while. Mm -hmm. um, so that part is very meaning making for me. As a clinician, I will say I don't regularly share um, my story in part because I think it's really important we put our patients at the center of all we do. Um, there have been times where I thought a little bit of that was helpful. I also practice in a place where I have spoken many times and have this TEDx out in the world. So in fact, many of my patient families um, know this piece of me and, and may mention it. Just yesterday, someone actually uh, made mention of it, but, um, but it's not necessarily something that I, um, unless I really feel it's in service of the patient, um, would bring up. So I hope that answers that one question I saw go by. I think that's a great, great response, Shannon. It's um, the the notion that uh, one would want to be somewhat uh, in remission or healed, um, you know, before sort of telling a, the story of it that includes, uh, you know, reference to the time of suffering is, uh, is really valuable. I think one of the things that uh, has come up several times in the morning is the notion that uh, the healing or treating treatment relationship, the therapeutic alliance, also has areas of uh, privacy, that it, it needs to be uh, a place where one can be um, vulnerable and actually say things that one didn't even know one was capable of saying. And so that um, protecting that, uh, the, the sanctity, I guess, of that space is really uh, important.